Coming to you from the Twin Cities, this is The Pagan Voice. The Kumbh Mela kicked off on January 14th and will be the largest religious gathering in world history. The festival has attracted 100 million people from all over the world and is a 55-day ceremony focused on prayer, purification, and spiritual awakening. Among the spiritual leaders who were invited to participate in the event this year is Patrick McCollum, who is pagan. Patrick has previously been honored with the Mahatma Gandhi Award for the Advancement of Pluralism by the Hindu American Foundation has addressed the Kazakhstan Parliament at the World Forum of Spiritual Culture, and recently presented a pagan spiritual perspective to Tahir al-Mazri, the president of the Jordanian Senate, as part of the peace talks between Israel and Palestine. Patrick joins us today from Malabad, India. Patrick, welcome to the Pagan Voice. Well, thank you very much, Todd. So tell us about the Kumbh Mela. Well, the Kumbh Mela is the largest spiritual gathering in the world, and I might take that a step further and say it is the largest gathering of human beings in the history of humanity. Um, there's an expected um, attendance throughout the festival of about 130 million people. But the gist of the Kumbh Mela uh, is that the, there are three sacred rivers here uh, in India that come together and uh, right at the apex at the place where the three of them cross together into like a central place, it creates kind of a swirling in the water that's literally created a small island in the middle of it all. And that place, that vortex, is considered to be one of the holiest, most sacred spots on the earth. And the Hindu people believe that at certain auspicious times, um, that if they bathe in the river, particularly if they can bathe in that central vortex, which is called the Sangam, uh, that their sins, particularly for them, they're mostly Hindu, their karmic sins can be washed over. You know, being invited to participate as a pagan in an event like this is pretty historic. How have you been received by the other spiritual leaders there? Well, first I'd like to say that, you know, I'm an op openly a pagan, and I was specifically invited in that context and uh, this will be a first. It has never been done before. And I am being treated with the absolute uh, highest regard that you could imagine. Um, I'm in the camp that is literally the camp of the saints of India, and I am be being treated as an equal. Um, I was given the opportunity, you know, to actually initiate uh, the very first ceremony for the Kumbh Mela, and I've been involved in many, many interactions. But for the most part, uh, it's just, it's almost like being home. You know, they're like a second family for me here. And I've got to know the uh, various swamis and gurus and stuff. And as a result of our spiritual discussions between one another and our equal concerns for the world and things that are happening, I've managed to weave some alliances and as of today, I would say we have just short of a billion new friends. What has been the most in interesting experience that you've had so far? I think the first one, which was just profound beyond anything I could really explain, is just I was invited to do the uh, opening blessing uh, with just like five or six other saints from India. And um, we went down right onto the edge of the river at the actual Sangam, the most holy spot for them on the earth. And we did a ritual and literally standing on the river for as far as I could see to the horizons in, in all directions is solid people. I mean, the, just the sheer volume is almost stifling. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is coming to camp with us. Uh, he'll be here uh, next week, and so um, I'm going to do ritual with him on the river, and I'll be happy to fill you in on that when we get together again. 
Well, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us for today's show. I would like to do a follow-up story with you at the end of the Kumbamela to find out more about your experience there. Have a wonderful journey. Okay, thank you so much for covering this, Todd. The city of Catskills, New York, has been engaged in a six-year battle with the Matrium of Sibylle, claiming that the pagan organization should not be exempt from paying property tax as other charitable organizations in the state. At issue is whether the building is being primarily used as a residence for the members of the Matrium, or whether it is being primarily used for religious purposes. In a recent court ruling, New York State Supreme Court Judge Richard Platkin stated that, quote, the primary and predominant use of the property was to provide cooperative housing for a small group of individuals, with the religious and charitable uses of the proper property merely incidental to its residential use. Today we are joined by Catherine Platting, who is the founder and current director of the Matrium. Hi Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you. So help us understand what is happening between your group and the city of Catskills. Okay, um, basically we are a incorporated five, uh, IRS 5013C recognized church and religious charitable organization. Um, we incorporated in 2005. Um, the property uh, here at that time belonged to four priestesses, and we deeded it over once we were incorporated to the incorporation, the incorporated church, um, where, where we do charitable works. That's a, a big part of our mission is doing charitable works. Um, and the town of Casco seems to think that housing women in need and providing them with free room and board or almost free room and board if they have a little bit of resources is uh, some sort of a rental activity and not actually charity. So my understanding is that the city is demanding that you pay property taxes at the same rate that a for-profit organization would, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, they first granted us um, an exemption in 2006 and then abruptly removed it in 2007 without any explanation. What has been their justification for why this has happened? It's hard to say what their justification is because in the past, in some newspaper inter interviews, um, town officials have said that they considered us an illegitimate religion, which they're not legally entitled to do. Um, they've accused us of irregular services, which is... Uh, actually ludicrous because we haven't missed a new moon or a full moon or a solar holiday in over 10 years. Um, uh, the, our, our services are dead regular, plus we usually have some activity here on the property that's pagan-related or mission-related uh, every weekend, and often more than one. Is your position that this is a case of religious discrimination? In my mind, that's exactly what this case is. There was a and it unfolded during the, the, the process of, the, of all the various trials and motions and everything else that, in fact, it was a member of, of the town council who instructed our town assessor to assess us and take away our tax exempt status. Okay, so what now? Uh, what is your, what's your plan to deal with all of this? Well, um, we finally went to, to uh, a court trial a little over a year ago, after waiting for all these years, and um, for some reason a new judge was appointed. But uh, during the, the case of that trial, the town did not actually put on any kind of a case at all. Um, they, they simply introduced whatever evidence they wanted to in, in cross-examination. And um, our attorney and even the judge at the time gave us every indication that we had met our, our burden of proof and that we proved our case. So we were quite shocked uh, when the decision was handed down and it said that, uh, oh, it, it had language like you couldn't believe that, you know, a uh, limited number of adherents and therefore did not significantly serve a public benefit, um, that prayer, meditation, and spiritual activities are common in many homes and as such fall short of demonstrating uh, furtherance of a religion. Um, and basically said that our house was used to house priestesses and their guests, um, and therefore wasn't eligible for exempt. Well, that's the, that last part is really interesting because under New York law, 
that is in fact an exempt religious use of a property that is owned by a religious corporation. Um, so he actually ruled against the law on that. So if somebody wants to find out more about uh, what is going on between you and the city of Catskills, where can they go for more information? Well, we have um, a website at uh, www.gallia.com, G-A-L-L-A-E.com. Um, at the websites, there are buttons you can donate um, to us. It would be a fully tax deductible because we are, in fact, recognized as 5013C. Um, the, the IRS recognizes us, the state of New York recognizes us. It's a town of Catskill that refuses to recognize us. Um, and uh, we feel that, th that the, this case is, uh, has much broader implications than just the pagan community. We feel that you know, this, this uh, basically affects the rights of all minority religions in this country. Um, we dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. And if they can do it to us, they can do it to anybody. Well, it sounds like you're doing some very important work. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. In Stockholm, Sweden, the parent of a nine-year-old girl allegedly tortured her after being convinced that she was a witch. According to a report from the United Press International, the girl lost consciousness after being beaten and kicked by her mother and stepfather as they attempted to exercise evil spirits that they believed were possessing her. Prosecutors reported that the young girl was forced to drink a mixture of cleaning fluid and her own vomit and was subjected to electrical shocks to the mouth and face. The parents, whose names are being withheld, have denied any wrongdoing and, according to prosecutor Daniel Larson, still believe that their daughter could be a witch. This is the second case over the past year in Sweden in which parents have been accused of abusing their children in the belief that they were witches. In India, a 55-year-old woman was beaten to death by her in-laws in the Motitimbi village last week after they branded her as a witch. According to the police, Vita Devi was sleeping in her house when her brother-in-law and his family members forced their way in and dragged her out into the street. After yelling at her for being a witch and accusing her of casting evil spirits on other families in the area, they beat her with sticks and iron rods until she was dead. When her husband attempted to come to her rescue, family members held him back. Cases of women being branded witches and either being tortured or killed in India, particularly in the tribal areas, has become so rampant that a new law called the Rajasthan Women Prevention and Protection from Atrocities Bill was passed in 2011. According to the law, the identification of a woman as a witch that results in her mental and physical torture and humiliation is now a crime that carries a stiff prison sentence. Unfortunately, this has done little to stem the tide of almost daily attacks against women in the country under the guise of being witches. You know, every time I report on stories like these, I cannot help but feel a sense of loss for all of humanity. Our willingness to demonize each other and subject our brothers and sisters to humiliation and suffering, all in the fruitless attempt to alleviate the anxieties that reside within ourselves, simply leaves the world a sadder place and does nothing to shield us from the fear of an evil that doesn't even exist. I receive comments from viewers every day who question what stories like the violence against women, climate change, income inequality, and gender issues have to do with paganism. I submit that the rituals and teachings of paganism, as beautiful and powerful as they are, represent only one aspect of what it means to live as a pagan in today's world. It is also necessary for us to come down off of our mountain, out of our broom closet, and engage the rest of the world. Modern pagan thought has a lot to offer, and the world needs to hear what we have to say. As Victor Hugo once said, there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Well, this is our time for our voice to be heard on the issues that affect us, our families, our communities, and our world. Blessed be. Minnesota has a rich cultural inheritance given to us from the Norwegian immigrants that settled here over 100 years ago. What we would now call paganism or heathenry to them was simply the old ways. 
Joining me in the studio today is Kari Toring, a local artist, scholar, and advocate for the preservation of Norse paganism. She is known as a vulva, or staff-carrying woman. A vulva is a theologian, healer, and educator according to the old ways. And today she will share with us ancient concepts of this tradition that have relevance for our modern times. Welcome, Kari. Thank you oh. for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'd like to start with the, some of the key concepts of your tradition, such as the orlog. Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, orlog means uh, ancient law or primal law in Old Norse. And it has, um, I oftentimes use a spindle to, to describe it. When we are born, we have all of the stuff that was given to us by our parents and their parents and their parents and their parents. And not just the genetic material, but also the things that happened to them in the environments that they were raised in and the cultures that they were raised in. And <clears throat> so things like war or famine, different things affect how humans interact with one another. And those interactions can either be high functioning or dysfunctional. And um, when they are dysfunctional, um, they kind of creep along into our urlog until suddenly here we are in the modern world with habits or tendencies that are um, maybe self-destructive or um, not high functioning in, in one way or another. And we don't know where they came from. We assume that we're damaged, but it's, if we can learn to look into our urlog, we can find out which patterns those particular dysfunctions came out of and then shift those patterns in our own lives. And while we can't re-spin the past, we can change our response to right. what was spun. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that you know, the attitudes and, and notions that we receive from our parents as children we grow up with, mm -hmm. what we don't realize is that they inherited that from their parents who inherited that from their parents and so on. And some of these attitudes are, were created in, in another time and, and place. Right. You know, there are a lot of um, people who, who say, oh, she, she, was, uh, she grew up in the Great Depression, you know, and so you get these old ladies with hoarding every piece of tin foil or every, you know, they learned scarcity at that time. And then that translates to how they raised their own children and the attitudes that their own children come up with. Um, and so it can be as simple as we aren't in a depression in that way. We don't have to hoard things. Um, it can be as simple as just shifting that through the understanding of where those tendencies come from. Sure. We can shift that in ourselves. Now, you know I mean? Yeah, that makes total sense. And, and one of the things you, you talk about in your teaching is that, that inherited cultural trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, does that relate to the sense of the orlog as far as this energy, attitudes, et cetera, that have been passed down to us? Is that the same thing? Or is it different? Well, uh, inherited gr griefs or, or historical trauma is something that has been being worked with in culture groups all over the place. So Native American cultures have been working with this very heavily ancestor memory and ancestor trauma and how that plays out in the dysfunctions in the community today. Um, in um, Holocaust survivors, there's this whole um, inherited cultural trauma that they are working with. And so every culture has it. In Norse tradition, we, we call it um, urlog, and it's part of the urlog. So talents and um, burdens are all come through the urlog. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why ancestor honoring is such a huge and important part of Norse tradition. Ancestor honoring and then nature spiritual, uh, the, the nature spiritual piece that persists even in Norway today and all, all over in, in ethnic enclaves in the United States that have um, Scandinavian, deep Scandinavian roots. So when we when we look at our modern society, we look like let me take um, you know, like black on black violence for example. You know, 
do you think that some of the things that we're seeing manifest within like the, the African American community, is this in response to the, the inherited cultural memory of, of being slaves at one point in their lives? I can't speak to the African American community because I have I am not part of that community. Okay. But I can say that it manifests in the some kind of white people in our young men who are growing up and um, checked out and blasting well, that, children away. That was my next question yeah. was, well, how do you see it manifesting in the European cultures? Right, you know, so, descendants? It, so inherited cultural grief, um, Urlog manifests. One of the things you have to remember is in Norse tradition, in Old Norse, Old Germanic, there was no future tense. We didn't have a future tense in our language. And so everything was described as what we're going to do in the moment and the precedence of past that comes up. We look at the past as a nutritive source for decision making rather than looking at the future and saying, oh, we're going to forget the past. It's, it's, um, um, everything is about the past. And one of the things that happens in a culture as a body it's similar to what happens in our own bodies. If there's a, a dysfunction, it shows up as a, you know, pimple or something, you know, some physical manifestation. In the culture, these, these um, concentrated pain units in these men, these young men who are cut off from their mother principle, cut off from their mother tongue, cut off from their root system, cut off from a cultural precedence, completely cut off from the nutritive past, and they're agitated, and they don't know where to put this agitation, and they don't know where it came from, they don't even know it isn't theirs to hold, and they hold it, and it, 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 it implodes or it explodes. It's like the pimple on the on the face of Norse culture, of, of European culture, to have these ungrounded and unstable young white men carrying on this the burden of of a past that has been filled with oppression and 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 all kinds of um, great violence, especially violence against women. So we're talking about, you know, how this this detachment from our history, from our roots, is is creating behaviors in our society that are, you know, there's violent violence against women. People are going and doing these school shootings because they have this, you know, level of agitation. They don't even know where it's come from. And one of the things that I think about in, in the course of our conversation is also about our elders. Mm. You know, if, if we talk about being disconnected from our past, even now we're disconnected from our own elders. You know, we, we, right. we put them away they, and, and into retirement communities. How much interaction do they have with our children to pass on mm -hmm. knowledge? And, and how do you see the, the effect of that mm -hmm. within our culture? Well, I mean, that's a great point. In root cultures, and, and this is something that I can say as a blanket statement for all cultures, for all cultures there's a root culture that has values that are similar. Um, and what we have in America is just sort of a cotton candy culture. It's kind of looks like it's a solid cultural thing, but the first lick you take, it disappears and leaves your tongue burning. It's not real, it has no root. And so in all root cultures, you take the children and the elderly and you put them in the middle of the circle. And you take all of the rest of us and we form a circle around the children and the elderly because they are the past and then they are what's becoming. And so, you know, so many, so many people have live miles and miles and miles away from their grandparents or don't even know who, what elders there might be in their community. I, I went and ran into a, a guy, I said, well, it's a little like dancing, like, you know, in the old way. And he's like, oh, I don't have any roots. And I'm like, you have a story. You came from somewhere. Go find out. Go find out your story. It's a huge part of heathenry in, at, at large, and it's an essential to Norse tradition. 
Now you also teach and, and have students, right? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things you teach about is how to go about healing the Orlog. Right. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Right, so my Volvistav is a method of using a staff and stick, rhythm, breath, and the runes, which is the oldest known symbol system of Norse tradition. And um, by using these tools, we can balance the brain, we can realign our bodies with the world tree, we can begin to access ancestor memory and process it. Um, and it's, uh, I have two apprentices and a bunch of students around the, the country, so that's wonderful. That's fantastic. And, w and one last thing before we, we wrap up here. You have a CD coming out. Right. Tell me a little bit about your CD. Right. Well, The Neckin and the Bear is my new CD. Um, and one of the ways of getting at our ancestor stuff is through song, music, dance, the language. So it's about searching into the language. Um, and this particular CD is about the Neckin is a water spirit. And it is in my last name. My grandma's last name was Nikrim, which means the home of the Nekin. And then the bear is a fidya of mine. So the, um, the bear and the Nekin come together in this CD and two suites of songs that interact and kind of describe my orlog. Um, I have in performance a set of songs, one from each of my ancestors in their known languages. So. It's, it's disir songs, and singing in those songs brings up those memories and starts to heal that urlog. And, and that's just a wonderful way of getting at this stuff. Kari, thank you so much for coming in today. It's been really fascinating talking to you, and I hope that our conversation encourages people to look into their own roots. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Great. For many of us in modern American society, much of our cultural identity was lost when our forefathers and mothers crossed the Atlantic. Coming to America was an opportunity for a new beginning, but it also denotes a great forgetting. There's wisdom, guidance, and healing to be gained from connecting with one's own genetic heritage. For how can we know where we are going as a society if we have no idea where we have been? Thank you for watching. More to come from The Pagan Voice. Welcome, I'm Michelle Plug, and this is As We See It. During this part of the show, we will discuss a few topics that are impacting the world today from our perspective. For the first topic, we will discuss Beijing, and it has reported that the worst air quality since the United States Embassy began keeping record in 2001. The rating exceeded the highest level on a scale of 0 to 500, coming in at 755. To put this into perspective, any rating over 301 is considered hazardous. It is said that the people cannot see the road from the fifth story of any building. You know, this is what happens when there's no regulation on, uh, on environmental things. Uh, one of the things that I hear in, uh, you know, um, American businesses talk about all the time is, you know, we need to loosen the regulations so that we can compete in the world marketplace. But this is what happens, right? I mean, there's a reason why we have environmental, um, environmental regulations in place. Because right now, to live in, in China, uh, it will, particularly in, in certain areas, um, it's just, it's like living in a, in a toxic cloud. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and to kind of put this into perspective, you know, um, New York on a bad day has a rating of 60. Okay, so we, you know, if we think that there's cities here that have a bad air quality issue because of population, et cetera, et cetera, it's nothing at all like what they're experiencing in China. And it just, <laughs> I, I feel like what we're seeing is, is this is what happens when you have complete disregard for the people and the nature of your country. They are, sure, labor's cheap over there. Sure, you can make goods for cheap over there. 
you know, but at the expense of their of their people. You know, the, the healthcare costs are astronomical. You know, they have more deaths from lung cancer than anything else because of their air quality. I mean, 16 out of 20 of the world's most polluted cities are in China because they have very little regulations. And I just, it, it, it makes me sad to see that something's got to give, something's got to change in the way that we do business and industry, I think. You know, what I found exciting about this story was the fact that this is one of the first times China has been able to, or the media in China has been able to reach this many people about a subject like this. They've decided, um, I can't remember what the act is called, but they've decided that, you know, media is allowed to cover these types of issues from here on out on the environment. And that's what I think is so positive about the story is now there is global awareness because journalists and other parts of media are allowed to cover it. So it's a voice to the people, again, to say, hey, listen, this really isn't OK. And if, um, and, and this, is a real, this is a really big issue, mm -hmm. um, be, partially because of how big China is. I mean, China has 25% uh, of the world's population. And as their industry grows and as their energy cons consumption increases, the amount of, of pollution that is going to be produced, mm -hmm. the amount of greenhouse gas that's going to be released, uh, is just going to grow exponentially. And uh, one of the things that I thought was really, really disturbing, there were some satellite photos that were showing some of the smog from China. And you could actually see streaks of fog, or this, this smog, uh, crossing the Pacific. And they've actually been able to measure, in San Francisco, smog from China. That's unbelievable, but one of the you know it's great that 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 the government is starting to talk about it, the media is starting to talk about it. Things are starting to shift, but there's still you know opinions in China that's like we don't want to have to live with an American standard. You know why should why should the Americans impose their silly regulations on us? And I'm like, well. We don't have to impose anything on you. You might want to think about whether or not you're going to have any people to populate your country in the next hundred years if everyone has died from lung cancer. I mean, you know, yeah, you're you're becoming a rich country now, but then when there's no one left to enjoy that, or or it's completely inhospitable, what have you done? What have you lost at the sake of gaining power and wealth, really? And is it worth it? And wealth in, in one respect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I and and this is this is one of the arguments that I you know that I I'm, I uh, I make with people who are really against taxes, because people are like I shouldn't have to pay any taxes. I earned all this money, and it's like well you know what, um, paying paying extra to live in a in a clean world is like paying extra for a really good car. You know, you're going to be better protected. You know, it's going to perform better, and uh, and and the, the the overall experience is better. I mean, if and people spend a lot of money on cars, they spend a lot of money on homes, because they want to have a good quality of life, and uh, and the fact that uh, that it in China there has just been there's been no regard for spending money on these kinds of things. It's it's not as though. It's not as though they're they're really gaining uh, wealth in, in kind of an overall resource, but rather they're you know in some respects they're they're getting some money, but at the expense of, of their nation's health and uh, and well-being. And it's actually costing them. Um, in 2005, they ran a report that it's cost China um, 112 billion dollars in one year for their air pollution. So speaking of pollution, we're going to move on to our second topic. <laughs> Um, two of the world's greatest professional athletes, Lance Armstrong and Barry Bonds, have been shunned for taking some form of illegal performance enhancing substances. During his interview with Oprah, Armstrong admits to using EPO, cortisone, testosterone, human growth hormone, and illegal blood transfusions throughout his seven years of Tour de France wins. In the past, he has aggressively denied the allegations, even while under oath, to keep up his facade. And although Barry Bonds is a seven-time MVP and holds the home run record of all time, he was not voted into the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame this year due to the allegations for using steroids throughout his career. Bonds still claims he took the steroids unknowingly. Yeah. 
that's that uh, unknowingly, you know, I, I can say that I've, I don't think I've ever taken steroids un unknowingly. <laughs> of course, then I probably wouldn't know it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the thing, there, there's a couple things that I, I really find disturbing about this, this particular story. One is um, why, why has it become that, uh, that we, you know, in our society, you can't be considered to be great unless you've done something that, you know, that is just I extreme beyond what human beings should really be able to do. And, uh, and so in order to get there, in order to, you know, to be considered great and the, and the best, these people have to do, you know, unnatural things to their bodies in order to, to get there. And, uh, and that I think is, is really a statement about um, our culture as a whole and how we, and, and how we value people. Um, but the other the other point on that that I would I would like to make is that uh, where what the real tragedy, particularly of the Lance Armstrong thing, is that there are he won seven Tour de France's and and in every one of those there are seven people who should have won that, who he cheated, and stole their ability to win that despite all of their hard work, despite all of their dedication. And then for him to, you know, to, to lie about that and, you know, be out in the media as some kind of hero, I, yeah, that whole situation is really troubling. You know, a friend of mine said, well, he would have won that anyways. He would have won seven times anyways. And I said, well, I guess we'll never know. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll never know. And what a shame that is. We'll never know what his natural ability and talent was because he didn't give that a chance. Mm -hmm. Right. And it just, it just makes me sad that, you know, I mean, part of the part of being in sports is all about breaking records. You know, can you one up or the the last person who won this title? And we're getting to a point where we don't even know what the human body is really capable of. We don't know what's realistic anymore because we don't know who's doing drugs and who's not. You know, and I think that it's incredibly uh, sick that people would be willing to sacrifice their reputation and their health and their career for a few years worth of fame. And then to have it all, like with the case of Lance Armstrong, I'm thinking, why didn't you retire two years ago before all this came to a head? You could have gotten away with it, okay? But instead you let it play out and now you have to tell the world and you've lost everything. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the mentality behind that, unless there's something going on as far as the sponsorships that these you know, athletes get, if there's a lot of pressure to perform or to keep performing. And I think that the, it just points to a, a, an issue within the entire sports arena that, that needs to get addressed and needs to get changed. Um, it brings up definitely for me the, we're only as sick as our secrets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, I mean, he, it's like a lie he himself believed and he held on to. Um, but also what got brought up for me was what did, you know, what was the deal that was created so that he would speak to Oprah? Because it's at the end of the day, so much of this is about the sponsors and the money and this and that world. They'll take a lie like that to their grave if they can to keep up with the money. I heard a, uh, uh, somebody who is, is very familiar with that case uh, speaking on NPR the other day, and they were talking about how uh, Lance Armstrong has, uh, has ambitions to get into the Iron Man. And so the, the hope is that by kind of coming clean and taking his knocks that, you know, and, and you know, even if watching him on Oprah, he was very, very parsed and very careful about how he said things. I, I never really sensed that there was any genuine remorse. There was kind of like, yes, I did this. Yes, I did that. And, and it was very calculated to try to just get it out there in a way and frame that in a way that would allow him to get back into some kind of sports. Yes, absolutely. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. More from the Pagan Boys soon. According to Pentagon figures from the Associated Press, military suicides among active duty troops reached a record high in 2012 with 349 American soldiers taking their own lives. This number exceeds the deaths of Americans in combat in Afghanistan, which came in at 295. 
Interestingly, half of the soldiers that committed suicide had never been deployed to a war zone. But according to military suicide researcher David Rudd, these 50% are facing problems within relationships, money, and other everyday dilemmas. The other main category of troops committing suicide tend to be Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress, depression, or substance abuse. Although this is a serious situation that needs to be observed and handled with compassion, let us also consider that military suicides are still at a lower rate than that of suicides of civilians. I don't even know where to begin with this one. I mean, it's, it's tragic that this is happening, you know, and as I had been doing some reading on this, this topic, you know, it was, it was talking about how they've lowered some of the requirements for getting into the military. So they're thinking that maybe some of this is people with some behavior issues who had nowhere else to go came into the military and that's part of what we're seeing. But I think that there's, there's multiple sides to this, to this issue. I mean, we're in 2012, look at what's going on in our, just in, in our economy today. You know, there's um, this war in, in Iraq that, you know, is, it, it is starting to wind down, but, you know, many of us are asking what was the point of it in the first place. And um, I think that there's just a lot of, um, still, there's still a stigma of being attached to being a soldier and, and going out and defending your country. So I think there's a lot of, of different things that play into what we're seeing. I, I, what I find really interesting about this is the number of suicides for people that hadn't been deployed. The, the, the PTSD, to, I, could, I could totally understand how you know, traumatic experiences like that, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially with the associated depression and some other things that come along with that could really contribute to a, an increased suicide rate. But I, I, I just find it so fascinating that the people who hadn't been deployed uh, actually had, you know, had more, there was more suicides of people who hadn't been deployed than people who had. And what, what this kind of brings up for me is um, really more of a question of what's going on with our youth. Because mm -hmm. it, what we're seeing is we're seeing an, an emergence of, uh, of our youth that are going into the military. And, um, you know, and when you also look at what is happening with you know, school shootings, with you know, some of the violence that you just, you know, you just wonder what is, what's wrong. I wonder if this is just another aspect of that. Um, the, interestingly that you bring that up, what um, one of the researchers said was suicides committed tended to be white men under the age of 25 with junior rankings and less than a college education. Mm -hmm. And that was the average. There is, I, I teach undergraduate psychology, and one of the things that I, you know, that I do when I start a class is I, I usually write three or four statistics up on the board. Uh, one of it is, is that 25% uh, of all African American males, black males, will spend some time in prison. That 95% uh, of all serial killers are white males, and 98% of all of the people who develop fibromyalgia are, uh, are white women. And you know, in looking at those statistics, the, the reason why I bring that up is, is like, what is it about our society? What is it about the, the pressures that we are putting on people and, uh, and how we are, um, what our expectations are on, on individuals that is, you know, is kind of manifesting some of these things? And you look at the, the violence and you know, the school shootings and things like that and, and you wonder, well, you know, kids who grew up, you know, kids who grew up in, uh, in the 1950s and 60s were much more likely to have a parent at home and have, peop and have parents that were much more engaged. Um, and you know, as, as both parents went out and worked and there was a lot more stress in the household, you know, how did that impact these kids' ability to, you know, to form bonds and attachments? And you know, now, 18 years later, uh, are we now starting to see you know, the result of some of that. I mean, I think that's a question to be asked. I don't know that anyone really has an answer to that. But 
think that's something to think about. Well, you know, what this makes me think of is I had a conversation with someone at one point where he was a, a white guy and he was going on about all of the different programs and, and, and things that were uh, set up to help single mothers and immigrants and, you know, people of color, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no one to help him because there was this assumption that because he was a white man, he was already privileged and entitled. And therefore, why would he need help in the first place? And so I think that we have these young men who don't, don't know what their future is, don't know what they want, maybe don't feel like they have a future, don't know how to find help, and feel like they're surrounded by people who don't understand that they're possibly suffering in the first place. So how can we really reach into this population and go, okay, you're clearly, because I mean, we, we had a huge discussion last week mm -hmm. about you know, men and in the crisis of masculinity. So how can we really shine a light on this and go, okay, we're listening. What, what are you really trying to tell us? What do you really need? Yeah, and where's the support system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At this point, where, yeah, what is our miss as a whole? Where's the support? How can we give that to each other? Um, so moving to our fourth and final topic. A new show in Austria is making use of wasted food by dumpster diving and creating gourmet dinners from their findings. Show director David Gross and his colleagues call this cooking style and this show waste cooking. Gross was astounded by the 105,000 tons of food thrown out each year in Austria alone and decided to create awareness through television about how much of the wasted food could be used. Although Austria's number sounds high, in America we waste up to 33 million tons of food per year. The, the fact that his last name is Gross will never stop being <laughs> funny. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, when I first heard this concept, I was just, I, for, at risk of using a pun, I, I was kind of grossed out, right? <laughs> I mean, I was just like, oh my God, that sounds disgusting. But I think the point is, is something that I had never thought about. I mean, I, I knew that we would throw away food. I had no idea that it was that much. You know, there's, there's two things I want to point out about this. The first one is, is that we, there's all these anti-hunger campaigns, you know, of one in three children are starving, yada, yada. I'm like, well, if we're wasting all this food, the problem isn't growing in production. The problem is in the dissemination of how do we get the food that's needed to these people. You know, so that, that was my first point. You know, my second point is, you know, I kind of have a personal connection with this story. There's an organization here in the Twin Cities called Sisters Camelot, and what they do is they go to all of the co-ops and cull all of the all the food that's expired their sell-by dates. So you can see them every week and get free organic produce. And they just give it away to anybody who shows up. And I, 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 I had to go to them. I had no other choice. That's how I had to survive at that time. So when you think about things like waste cooking, it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not, I mean, yes, they show images of, of them dumpster diving and all of this sort of thing, but they also have a special way they handle food in Austria as opposed to here. Whereas what happens here in the U.S. is that there are organizations like Sisters Camelot that go to the stores before they even hit the dumpsters in the first place. You know, one of the things that uh, that I had often thought of is, you know, I knew that there was a lot of food that was thrown away, and um, just I just had this thought one day that you know, people that are getting out of prison, if there was a way that they could find some gainful employment, their chances of being successful outside of prison uh, go up exponentially. Yet. People who have some kind of prison record will oftentimes find it extremely difficult to get any kind of student loans to go back to school or, or to get any, any kind of employment. I thought it'd be cool to, really cool to, to start some kind of program where people who, uh, who are coming out of prison can, can get involved in something like what the Sisters of Camelot are doing where there's a, a taking of this food, reprocessing it. If there's produce that can be, you know, that can be converted into, uh, you know, into preserves or anything like that, that then could help, you know, uh, not only feed the poor, you know, service soup kitchens and all of that, it would be, you know, kind of a way of, of utilizing some of that at the same time, giving some meaningful experience to people that are coming out of prison. 
Absolutely. You're just creating a whole new business, aren't you, Tom? <laughs> I love like your spare time. What are you going to do? That's I know, good. I know, I know. There is, you know wel welcome to my hell. You know, my brain never stops. <laughs> I just think it's cool that this guy took the time to create a show to build awareness yeah. around this issue. And it, it is a very complex issue. Again, um, one of the things that I read up on said it's just the same simple rules of reduce, reuse, recycle just with your food. Um, that just sounds still gross to me, but, <laughs> but I think it's incredible that he's doing it. Well, time is up for today's discussion. Thank you for watching. I'm Michelle Plug. Stay tuned for more from the Pagan Boys. Yoga is a verb and can be defined as union, a connection, and a yoking together. What does that mean for the urban slums surrounding Nairobi, Kenya? It means bringing rivals of different tribes to practice yoga side by side on their mats. It means the possibility for soldiers to put down their weapons of war and go out into a humble warrior pose. It means to share sweat, laughter, and the chance for a new life, the chance for a new community with each other. Africa Yoga Project has certified 52 teachers that earn a living wage to teach yoga throughout Kenya. One woman created this opportunity for thousands of Kenyan lives to be opened up through sharing what she loves, yoga. This woman is Paige Ellenson, the co-founder and director of the Africa Yoga Project. It all began in 2006 with a family trip to Africa when Paige saw a group of Kenyans playing. They asked Paige if she could teach them yoga. Less than a year later, she was voluntarily teaching yoga for two months in Kenya during the elections. Quickly, the country was involved in a political war where tens of thousands of people were fleeing their homes. During this time, Paige continued her yoga mission and stayed through the discomfort and fear. It was the process of staying which led her to commit to develop the Africa Yoga Project. She found that the yoga-isms were incredibly effective not just for her, but for the greater community. She decided to stay and create from the purpose within her heart and because of this, she has changed the lives of millions. When asked why she does it, Paige responded, I realized I could be effective through yoga, through something more physical than our religion or our tribe. I do what I do because I care. And once you find your passion, whether you are faced with a challenging or rewarding event, it makes you more unstoppable in your purpose. Once you have found that drive and passion, you are unstoppable. Now the Africa Yoga Project brings yoga to over 250,000 Kenyans each year through a down-to-earth process of training Kenyans to teach yoga and empowering them to facilitate classes throughout their communities. Teachers facilitate classes in prisons, schools, orphanages, special needs centers, HIV rehabilitation centers, deaf schools, and the Maasai villages. Paige's decision to follow her heart and purpose is an example of how one person's vision can create a new reality for more people than ever imagined. Thank you for watching. More from the Pagan Boys. Welcome to Viewer Mail, where we read and respond to some of the comments that we receive throughout the week. The first email is from Aaron. Aaron writes, so happy to see all of this. It's about time we get something fun and informative. Now, if it could only grow into an entire channel, pagan cooking, sports, etc., how cool would that be? Brightest blessings and best wishes for the show. Aaron, thank you very much. That's actually what we plan to do at PLTV. The Pagan Voice is the first of many shows to come. Rebecca uh, writes in response to our story last week, about Israel setting minimum body fat standards for, uh, for models. Rebecca writes, while I don't disagree that the new laws in Israel could be a step in the right direction for body image, it is not a completely positive direction. Real women have curves. While it's great to embrace curves and not feel self-conscious about having them, it's telling women that are naturally very thin or who have a smaller chest size that they aren't real women or are undesirable. 
It's no better to call an overweight person fat than it is to call a thin person anorexic. The issue should not be what size the models are. It should be if they are healthy or not. The real message should be to love your body whatever shape it comes in. Real women are tall, short, large chested, small chested, wide hips, narrow hips, etc. I, Rebecca, I could not agree with you more. And I, I thank you very much for your comment. I was so happy to receive an email from my mother about this show. She writes, hey Michelle, just some feedback. You know that I am a Christian. So one of the things that I like about PLTV is that religion is not what the focus of the show is about. The focus appears to be in presenting the news to find the root cause to the issues instead of sensationalizing stories. The show also puts the human connections back into the news. It is, ref it is a refreshing perspective. I love you, mom. Well, I'm so glad that my mom picked up on that because that's definitely what the Pagan Voice is about, is bringing a more broadened perspective and rehumanizing the stories that we find in our culture through news. So I'm so grateful that you took the time to write me, Mom. It's great to hear from you, and I love you too, and I hope that you're comfortable sharing this show with your friends and loved ones. Wow, I gotta say thank you to your mom. What's your mom's name? Debbie. Debbie, thank you, Debbie. That was beautiful. And I would just like to take a moment to contrast that with what my mom said, okay? The first show comes out and I call my mom and I say, you gotta watch the show. Call her back and I said, so what'd you think? She's like, well, you watched it. <laughs> yes, but I want your opinion, mom. What do you think? And the first thing she said to me was, you cannot do that to your hair ever again. Is that all you have to say, mom? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just, I had to take a step back and I'm like, thank you, mom, for your input. That's great. And the funny thing is, is that we actually have had several people write in to comment about what was going on with my hair that day. And I would just like to say this. I am Brianna. I am a performance artist, and I'm gonna do whatever I feel like doing with my hair. And you better like it. Thank you for writing. I love you, Mom. <laughs> awesome. So uh, thank you very much for your comments. If you would like to sound off about the Pagan Voice, please, please send your comments along with your name and town, to contact at paganliving.tv. Join us next week for another episode of The Pagan Voice.